finding time to be focused and because I'm spread pretty thin. Mm -hmm. um, and then actually finding that focus once I was there, uh, you know, what I, what my subject matter and um, audience were looking for. What I came to realize is that I have this little voice in the back of my head that's lying to me about being a martyr. It says, you know, oh, you should feel bad that you don't have time to do this and somebody's not taking care of you and and making a, a priority for you to make art when all those kind of struggles of having daily duties and daily demands can inform your art making quite a bit. I felt like I was using maybe in the back of my head that martyr voice a little bit too much. And it, just reading about it made me brought it to the forefront of my consciousness that, hey, oh, I don't have time or um, somebody should be handling stuff for me so I could focus on being an artist when really those things don't help me move forward at all. And taking on more of that trickster attitude, which I think a lot of artists and myself have that nature anyway, that cunning and that cleverness and that mobility, um, that would be a lot more productive to put into the forefront of my thinking as I make art, because that's going to move me in a direction. Being a martyr is for your ego or your personality or something. But if you're a trickster, then you're doing that to get something done, um, or at least the way I'm viewing it right now. Well, a martyr is a victim, right? And victims right. don't do well. That, that's a great question that I did not look at. Um, but I, I really rail against people who talk about artists lives are lives of suffering and lives of torment and lives of poverty for some reason i react really strongly when i hear people saying those things Me too. so i think that probably somewhere along the line that maybe uh i don't know our community or society as a big whole kind of has that mentality and i kept running across it that voice wasn't loud in my head but it, it was there for me it probably gets a little bit worse because i'm a school teacher uh. and so that that is just the buzz you know that you can't make it as an artist so you should study something practical which there's truth but there's a lot of lies to that too what's practical because <laughs> there's a ton of engineers out there that are selling insurance so the program I teach in is very rigorous towards academia. These are a lot of my students go on to um, all of those students go on to some sort of four year institution, but some of them go to Harvard and some of them go to wherever. Um, I only have a handful of students who study art after after their high school experience. Mm -hmm. And some of them I, I noticed uh, they don't like selling their artwork. They don't want to get rid of it. They want to hold on to it because they know it might be one of their last experiences of doing art, or at least they believe that in their head. And I, you know, I just try and encourage them to have creative lives, but a handful go on and do lots of stuff. And a lot of them don't see it as a practical thing for their life, but they also don't see it as a, an avocation for their life. So. The fact is, is that we live in a creative economy. So if you have, if you're just memorizing, right, and you're not creating, how far are you going to get? Right. Um, yeah, there, <clears throat> in Colorado, speaking of creative economy, it's always the creative arts and industries, entertainment have always been in the top five. Um, they beat out gas and oil. So, like, it's a major boost to our economy and for some reason people don't make that connection between studying art and having a livelihood that could be you know based in art um it's, it's interesting really strange. that because i actually have had an, uh the Co colorado creative industries which is your state arts council they they like my program a lot they've sent me a number of students probably not to let other people influence me and i I went my own way on a lot of stuff, but not on that. And I don't know why. So 
I think I would say, you know, get clear on what you want and then don't let anybody get in your way. A lot of artists that I was around were in academia and they weren't really artists, right? And I kept saying, well, how do you sell art? And nobody can answer that question. So I think maybe that kind of conglomerate group idea of all those people just being involved with art, but not selling art and making a living from art kind of attached to me. And I was aware of it and I tried to stay away from it, but that's where I was and I wasn't finding anything different. Did you listen to my last interview that I did with one of the tenured art professors who's in our community? I haven't gotten to that one yet. Well, let me just say this, you know, I mean, she's obviously wants to sell her art, but art professors don't want to sell their art and they don't know how to sell their art and they're teaching the next generation of artists. So surprise, they can't sell their art when they graduate. Right. And that, I, I see that as a disservice. I've always, uh, so as, a, as an artist, I've sold my art since the day I left college and even during college, but I, I've survived a little but I've never thrived. And that's why I'm, that's why I signed up for this program is to actually thrive and be what I would consider a success where it's the driving force in my life. So you got to define success for you, not somebody else's definition, but for you and from, and also define like the progress to success, right? So if success to you is making a hundred, one hundred fifty thousand dollars in sales, I'm making that number up, right? So based on where you are today, what's the next best step? And then when you get there, the next best step. The mistake I see artists making is they haven't defined success, and then they they just they don't define the interim milestones clearly enough to get them to success. So that can be um, the thing that stops them. And that's so, so easily resolved. If, don't get me started on art schools. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree. I think we're super in alignment with that. I just like hanging out with high schoolers because they have awesome energy and they're hungry for life and they're really receptive to stuff. But I think that, man, I'll probably get <laughs> fired if I say something super loud, but the, schooling can be a disservice to people that um, can't see outside of its limited use, you know, function. Um, focus and passion. So to actually, I guess, be present in the time I set aside to do something, to to get rid of all the distractions, and to be passionate about those things as I do them. Getting organized is a big part of it. And that's based on having priorities. So instead of, like you had mentioned, uh, managing time is not really possible, but managing your priorities is. Mm -hmm. So I think setting those in, as my friend said about priorities, a violent way so that they act <laughs> in the right order. Every step so far you've, uh, um, you codified a system, but all the steps are actionable. I'm at a kind of crux right now. I'm at the, I just got my why. So I'm really, I don't know. My heart's excited about that. I think I sat on the fence literally for a year watching your videos and the creative live core and some other courses. Um, and it just felt like I needed to do it the whole time, but I didn't trust myself that it was the right decision. So. But now I can I can feel all the disparate parts of my universe starting to focus in and really concentrate on this process. So if if they're anything like me and they need some way to to hone in on a, a target, this is one way to do it. And it's the only way that I've found. And I've read all kinds of books about artists and all kinds of books about marketing and all kinds of books about self development. Um, but this is giving me a way to put them all together in a holistic puzzle that all the pieces fit in.